course, like everything ran late. You, you, ever, you ever have a, I'm just gonna walk around here, is that okay, can I talk while they're doing this? Isn't that awkward? It's very awkward. So, um, you know, you always have a plan, you know, and I plan things out and then God goes, hey, you're not gonna do that, what are you thinking? So, we, I was gonna, my plan was, you know, I'm a pastor, so I'm gonna go to the National Cathedral and propose, but like we went to dinner and to get hamburgers and it took an hour and a half. So I said, well, this must be a hint. So um, we were at the Lincoln Memorial and uh, 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 the, the, I turned around and there's the reflecting pool. If you've ever been to DC, there's a reflecting pool and you can see the Capitol, you can see the Washington Monument. And I know all about the Washington Monument. I know about the speeches that were given at the Lincoln Memorial. And I said, this is just beautiful. So I had let everybody in on it, except for her, of course. And, um, and so, you know, we went down and I proposed right there. Um, but I forgot to tell her something when I proposed. And I should have told her that, um, you know, I'm a pastor. And that means that God um, allows things to happen to me so I'll have stories for church. <laughs> and that means that you're going to be in some of these stories. And so the next day we did the Half Day DC, which was awesome. One of our members, Diana, got us uh, into a Capitol tour. By the way, your congressman can do that if you ever go there. It was awesome. It's awesome. If you've never done that, it was just phenomenal. And we did that, and I actually made the girl hurry. I felt kind of bad. By the way, two statues in DC for each state. Florida has two, so you get to choose two of the most important people in the state, right? For all history, all of history, you get to choose two people, right? So other people, you know, Rosa Parks, and, and they've got, you know, just incredible people. You know who Florida chooses? The guy who invented air conditioning is in the Capitol. That is absolutely, that is absolutely true. You get two statues, and one of them is the guy who invented air conditioning, and I must say, I fully agree. After the hurricane, that's the most important guy in Florida. I don't care who did uh, other things. The guy who invented AC, I love that guy. And, uh, but anyway, so, uh, so we, we basically hurry. We gotta take the, the rental uh, van back and everybody's together and we're you know, dragging stuff. And you know how it is, you're headed to the airport and you're in a hurry and then you go through um, the um, undressing um, area, which we call TSA. TSA, please take your shoes, clothes, anything we want off of you, and you pretty much, oh, oh you want a belt? You want shoes, okay? And, and you know, you, everything out of my face, what do you need, you know? And of course, I'm the one who always gets the extra search. I think they're, it's pastors, and they, we look like we're up to something. So we go through security, and we get on the other side, you know, they have those gates, and, and she looks down, and her diamond is gone out of her ring. Yeah, see, I told you there'd be stories. And so, um, and it, start, so it started right away. And um, so we, of course, you know, start looking on the ground and we can't, you can't go back through TSA. They don't like that. They don't like backwards. They don't allow backwards. And so we, um, so we, you know, we talked to the TSA agent, we got numbers, we're calling, you know, lost and found. And by the way, each airport now has two lost and founds. Did you know that? Because TSA has one and the airport has a different one. Just so you know. So anyway, just in case. And then, you know, of course the rental car company, you know, maybe it was left in there, maybe it fell. I mean, knowing that this is like needle in a haystack or worse, um, uh, diamond in uh, uh, DC. But anyway, so, so looking everywhere, we finally say, you know, we'll just go to the gate. There's not much we can do. And so we go and sit down at the gate. She reaches in her bag to get something and inside the bag was the diamond, from her diamond ring. And so, but here's kind of a cool part too. I love to always say that God gives retakes, okay? So she's kind of a private person and she likes, you know, like just, you know, privacy, you know. So so um, I went to the jewelry store and they got it put on and, and I, they weren't supposed to get it back till Friday, but we got it back Thursday night. So I was able to take her to a park in Orlando with just uh, her daughter and I and, and her and, and propose to her again. So I said, you know, we're gonna get it right this time and keep the ring on, so, but God loves retakes, so. Aren't you glad that he loves retakes? He never fails you, he just gives you retakes and he's gonna wait to see if you pass. So hopefully we'll all, we'll all pass. So now, for those of you who don't know, we're gonna talk about boundaries and I, I do dumb things. Did you know that? I, anybody in here surprised? Have you told Kristen that yet? Okay, so um, just for a while, y'all just pretend I'm great. Okay, just, oh, he's great, he's great, we'll pray for you. And so last night, thank you, wait, last, so sweet. But last night, some people kept coming up to her and going, for you. And I, you know, so, 
<laughs> like real seriously. We're praying for you, so I don't know. Um, but anyway, so um, years ago we adopted uh, uh, Jenna. Uh, we were in Taiwan, and uh, there was this stair. We were looking at different monuments and stuff, and there was this huge staircase. And it looked like in Philadelphia, where Rocky runs up, you know, and there's like a courthouse at the top, you know, and I thought, well, that's awesome. So I ran to the top of that staircase, and I turned around and, and wanted to get a picture, and the guy who was touring us was taking a picture, and I uh, did like this, and the guy goes, oh. and I'm like, what? And I turn around, and there are armed guards <laughs> behind me. It apparently was a burial chamber for the original uh, Taiwanese emperor, and I just like desecrated their air or something. And I'm so I'm thankful I'm alive today. So so that was like really bad taste. Just want you to know it's not the first thing I've done in bad taste, but it was up there. So so here's what I know about boundaries. Okay, is we're going to start this series on boundaries. There are people in your life. That will accidentally, they, maybe nobody's ever taught them that they shouldn't just come and steal your car or they shouldn't just come borrow things out of your office without asking, right? You know those people? They shouldn't just, you know, come down to the church and say, hey, you know, we need a copy machine. We're just going to take that home with us or whatever, right? There's people who do that by accident. But then there's other people, manipulative people. People who try to get their way, who will violate your boundaries on purpose. And so let me let you know something about this series, okay? If you are one of those people that feels guilty saying no, and you feel like you should maybe never say no, this series is for you. However, if you're also one of those people that's been hurt in the past, and so you never say yes anymore because you, when you say yes, you tend to get burned out. You do too much. I want you to learn how to have a good yes so that you can do the things God's called you to do but not do the things that he's not called you to do. Now, let me just give you an example. Every single week as a pastor, Somebody recommends, and, and by the way, keep doing it because it's not like I don't listen and things don't happen. But every single week, somebody recommends something for the church to do. Okay? And this is why someone has to be in charge, by the way. But every week, somebody rep, uh, uh, you know, wants a new program or a new this or a new that. If we tried to do every idea that was presented to me in a month, we couldn't do it. Everyone would be burned out. We would all quit, and you would go to another church. So there's a time to say no to people. But there's also a time to say yes to people. And the idea of boundaries is learning how when somebody comes to you and makes a request, or when you're training up your children, like the Bible says, or for some of you, your grandchildren, who your kids aren't doing such a good job, so you're going to help them out. As you're training them and helping them to learn boundaries, this series is going to help you to do a better job. Now, here's what I've learned. Many Christians have bad boundaries, and so uh, bad boundaries, first, first of all, cause problems. I'm sorry, I should have said that. Stress, burnout, marriage trouble, family, depression, discouragement, frustration, irritation, uh, you name it, and bad boundaries, call it. And all of us know somebody who will do anything for anyone, and usually that person at some point is unhappy. Okay, But we also know people who do nothing for anyone because they were hurt one time, so they started saying no. Bad boundaries cause issues because if you're not doing what God's called you to do, you will also be discouraged because God has called you to do things. And by the way, some of you who've been discouraged and you feel kind of depressed, get out of your house. Go help somebody. Say yes to somebody that you can do something for, and you may find that just that alone changes your attitude. Now, here's why many Christians don't have good boundaries, and here it is. Number one, they've been taught that Christians don't say no. They've been taught Christians don't say no. You're, not, you're supposed to be a Christian. When the pastor asks you something, you should say yes. By the way, that's a great rule, so just write that one down. This applies to everyone except the pastor, right? All of us wish that we were the one that everybody said yes to. The truth is, parents, you need to allow your kids to say no. But you're like, but I'm trying to teach them. And yes, if you want to teach them, then you create consequences for certain no's. So, for example, I say to my boys, hey, 
you have a choice today. It's a great choice. You can mow the grass or you won't have the internet access code for today. No, Father, I do not want to mow the grass. No problem. No sweat off my nose. Not a problem at all. You just made a choice. You were able to tell me no. I didn't get angry. I didn't get mad. But suddenly you have no internet. And it's amazing how motivational the lack of internet is today. It's almost as motivational as the lack of air conditioning was for many of you. <laughs> Number two, they don't want to take responsibility for themselves. The truth is that some people want to blame everybody else for what they're doing or what they're not doing. You know, I would do that, but I'm having to do this. I would do that, but so-and-so said I couldn't. I would do that, but so-and-so. And they blame everybody else for their choice. Listen, you are responsible for your own life. Number three, they blame others for their problems. Well, I wouldn't be so tired if it wasn't for fill in the blank. I wouldn't be so this if it wasn't for that. Listen, you are responsible again for you. Number four, they don't understand biblical boundaries. So we're going to set the table today. Truthfully, this is probably the least exciting of the sermons. Isn't that good to hear at the beginning of a sermon? This is the worst one. That's always a good way to start. Let's just go home now. All right. But so we're going to set the table today so that as you hear the rest of the series, here's the deal. There's a book called Boundaries. It's a biblical book. They use the Bible. It's two counselors. They did a great job of, of getting scriptural input on what the Bible says. But the Bible is full of good boundaries. And so you can read the book. I have a small group. My small group starts tonight at 6 o'clock at my house. There's, there's uh, information on the table. You can show up at my house tonight if you want to. We will find room for you. If I've got to put you in the backyard and get a video projector, we will find room. We don't know where you're going to park because there's branches everywhere. But just park somewhere in the neighborhood. In the other people's grass, and it'll be great. All right. <clears throat> Got like the other people's grass? Did you like the... Okay. So here's some laws and boundaries from Galatians chapter 6. Number one, you are responsible to others, but not for them. Teachers, teach your students this. Parents, teach your children this. Bosses, make sure you do this with your employees. Employees, make sure you apply this to your bosses. Galatians 6.2 says this, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Now, too many people have mistranslated that verse to mean, i got to do, anytime somebody's stressed out, I've got to help them. Okay, once again, if I tried to help everybody and do everything that everybody recommended to me, it would be a very long day. Every day, and I wouldn't take care of me, and I wouldn't take care of my family, and I would never see my children, right? And, and all of these things would happen, and it would ruin my life, right? Because I don't have good boundaries. So what does this mean? Well, this is really cool. So look, go back one slide for me, if you don't mind. So it says, carry each other's burdens. One, one more forward. Somewhere in between those two. Oh, it got bumped off the slide. You know what it is? Because they changed the projector when you... Okay, okay. So, so let me go back to the verse. So the verse says, carry each other's burdens. This word for burden in the Greek is a really cool word, but it literally means like a weight that you're under, that you can't lift yourself. And so here's the idea. If somebody encounters something that they can't handle... Now, I'm not talking about people who are drama queens and kings who everything is a, is a problem, okay? If you have teenagers, you probably go through the everything's a problem phase, okay? But what I'm talking about here is the idea that if it's a weight that can't help. For example, if you've got an 85-year-old grandma whose roof was blown off, you don't hand her a tarp and say, now here's some nails and get up there and put your roof on. Right? That's craziness, right? What do you do? You carry her burden. You know that she can't do that, so you go and do that. So pay attention in life, and even today as you go through life, as you deal with your children, as you deal with other people, are they carrying their burden? Are you trying to carry things for them? And we'll get a little more specific in that. Now, here's what I want you to know. You are responsible to others, but you're also responsible for your attitude in this. I cannot tell you the number of times people have said to me, I'm trying to be a good Christian, and this has happened three or four times now as a pastor, so I think there may be some of you that deal with this. They say, I'm trying to be a good Christian, but I'm the only one at work that washes the dishes. And I'm the one that has to go in the break room and wash the dishes. Now, I used to basically just tell people, be a good Christian and wash the dishes. And then I realized something. 
God didn't call us to do everything for everyone else. So you have two choices. Here they are. Number one is if God's called you to wash the dishes, go and wash the dishes and wash your attitude. Because the truth is, if God's called you to do something, at some point you're going to get aggravated. Listen, I'm the pastor of a church. There are days that there are things in church that I don't want to do. Does that shock you? There are days that I deal with something and I think, I just really don't want to. So I don't just go there and go, well, I'm just going to have a bad attitude. <laughs> right? What do I do? I realize, you know what? I have an attitude issue. So you have a choice. If you're washing dishes and nobody else is washing them, you can, number one, change your attitude. You know what? I'm going to do this. The joy of the Lord is my strength. I'm washing dishes. It takes 45 seconds or four minutes or whatever it takes to do. And I'm done. And I'm glad to bless this group. Or here's your second choice. You ready? Other people need to learn how to wash the dishes. Eventually, if you don't wash the dishes, one of two things is going to happen. Either someone's going to wash the dishes or code enforcement is going to show up at your workplace. You have children. I cannot get my children to do A, B, C. Yes, you can. They have to have consequences. If you don't do A, B doesn't happen. And let me tell you something about dirty clothes and teenagers. Eventually, they will learn to wash their own clothes. Now, granted, if you have boys, it may take months. The smell will just continue. And, and at some point, they will meet a girl and they will go, you know what? I really should wash my clothes. You, you have a choice. Now, if you want to wash your kids' clothes, that's your choice. But you can't be like, I have to do this. No, you don't. You don't have to do anything. And that takes the pressure off of you. So let me ask you a question. Is there someone who's overwhelmed that you should be helping? Somebody who can't handle something. Number two, we honor others and ourselves with good boundaries. Galatians 6, 3. If anyone thinks there's something when they are not... They, did, they deceive themselves. And this is really cool because in the Greek it says, if anyone thinks they're the one when they are the zero, then they deceive themselves. Another way of saying it is, if anyone thinks they're the one when they're not the one, they deceive themselves. And here's what it's talking about. People who are arrogant do not have good boundaries. You hear me? So you and I all know somebody who's arrogant and self-centered. Many of you have them in your family. Some of you married them. That's not my fault. You did it, okay? So now that you're married to them, what do you do? You have to have good boundaries, right? Because here's the deal. An arrogant person thinks that your job is to serve them. And everything in life is there. So they will, if you work with a selfish person, they will walk into your cubicle. They will grab your stapler off the desk and walk off. They will not say please. They will not say thank you. They will assume that everything in the world is there. If you're a teacher, you have students like this. Right? And what do you have to do? So you have to teach them. What do you do? You have to give them boundaries. So that's the point where you go, listen, I don't mind if you borrow my stapler. Just ask first. I don't mind if you, everything I have is yours, but you at least say, may I? I worked at a church one time years ago that things would disappear out of the office. And we'd go over to a Sunday school class and we would find our paper cutter or something else. And I would say, you know, and they would say, well, this is the church's, which means it's mine. I understand. But you know what? You really ought to let the office know if you're going to take their paper cutter because we have a lot of things that we use the paper cutter for. Well, I was doing my Sunday school class. Okay, I understand that the world revolves around you. Don't say that, by the way. That's not helpful. But if you'd at least let us know, you're welcome to borrow the paper cutter anytime. But if you'd at least let us know, what am I doing? Setting a boundary. Teach your children that. If you allow the world to revolve around your children, one day, they're going to wake up somewhere besides your home and realize it doesn't. Or they're going to be so selfish and self-centered that they're going to have a hard time having real, unselfish relationships with others. Now, here's the other problem. Not only do arrogant people struggle, people who have no self-esteem struggle. So if you're one of these people that think you have to say yes to everyone about everything or you just get cave into everything, you will burn yourself out trying to make other people happy. Your job is not to make everyone happy. Repeat after me. My job is not to make everyone happy. Now, 
That's real easy to say, but very hard to do because we want everybody to look at us and go, you're just great. There's times when you say no to someone that they will not be happy, especially a selfish, self-centered person, because they assume that everyone's there to serve them. But the truth is, there are times that you have to be able to say, these are my boundaries. This is what I'm willing to do. This is what I'm not willing to do. So let me ask you this question. Do you feel that you're more important than other people? Or do you feel like everyone else is more important than you? Both of those are out of balance. You need to know who you are so you can give a proper yes and give a proper no. We'll be talking about that more in the weeks to come. Number three, we are responsible for our own actions. This is the summary of boundaries. Because you're responsible for you. God has you as a steward, as somebody who caretakes everything he's given you. If you go to our office today, there is an old car, a World War II car. We've been at that office now uh, a little over five years. And there's been several people that have tried to buy this old car from the owner. And it, apparently it was like an emperor. And the emperors are a common theme today, apparently. But, but apparently it was somebody important in World War II, and this car was very valuable. But day after day, week after week, as I drive into that parking lot, one week I came in and you could see where somebody had thrown a baseball at the windows and busted all the windows. Then another week as I went in, I noticed that somebody had taken the roof panel out of that car. And then another week I came in and somebody had the engine thing and had stolen parts of the engine. So even though the owner of that car was not willing to sell it, he also did not protect it. So if you go there today after the hurricane, that car is, is not, has no value now. Is, I, I can't imagine it has any value. An old car that would be so great for pictures and other things is just wasted. Just wasted today. Why? Because somebody just said, hey, this is mine. Here's the deal. For some of you, you haven't said yes in a long time, and you have gifts and talents, and they are rusting and rotting because you're afraid to say yes because in the past, you said yes too much. Let me tell you something. That is nobody else's fault but yours. If you don't know how to say no, that's no one else's fault. If you haven't said yes, that's also your fault. God has given you gifts and talents. Listen to this. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. When you get to heaven, God's not, you're not going to go, God's going to say, how did you do with what I've given you? You're not going to say, well, so-and-so wouldn't let me. No, you're responsible for you. God's going to say, I gave you these things. This is the parable of the talents. I gave you these things. I gave you these gifts. I gave you these talents. I gave you these finances. You lived in the richest country in the world. You were the most comfortable people in the world. What did you do with what I gave you? Oh, well, I got burned out. I got a little bit tired because, you know, one time I served on a committee at a church. And then I said yes too much. So I just decided I would just come to church every week and sit in a, sit in a uh, not a pew, but I'd sit in a chair and just hang out. You're responsible for you. You can't say it's the pastor's fault. That's the best news I have. By the way, it also says in Scripture that pastors are held higher to a higher accountability for what I teach you. So get it straightened out, will you people? Because i got to do it to answer for you. All right. So are you taking care of what God has given you? Number four, let each person take responsibility for themselves. And this totally goes back to the first point and finishes it out. For each one, listen, should carry their own load. And this word for load is the original word for a ship's cargo. It's something that can be carried. A ship can only carry so much weight, but not too much weight. But here's the deal. Allow other people to carry what they're supposed to carry. So at my house, this is what this looked like. So. Um, as I was going through boundaries about a year ago, maybe a little over a year ago, and I had read it years ago, but for some reason, different times in life it applies, I began looking at my kids, and I realized I was cooking all the meals, and I was cleaning the table, and I was doing the dishes, and I felt like such a good father of the year for doing all that, and I said, wait a second, though, I'm not teaching my children any responsibility. So what I did just for dinner, and there's, we have a whole bunch of chores. Every child in my house has chores. The boys are mowing the grass. I'll talk about that soon. But, but every child in my house has chores. 
But every night, a different person, now my kids, three of my kids are responsible for dinner three nights a week. So they're responsible, which means that Kyle goes and picks up fast food. Uh, but anyway, but that's all right. Okay, hey, hey, I, I, it's his night. So, you know, that's okay. So we eat a lot of pizza. And, and, but, but every night, a different child is responsible for clearing the table. And Kyle hates it because he gets Tuesday night, and Tuesday night's Mexican night. That's the night Dad cooks, and there's about 400 dishes for Mexican night. So he's like, Dad, I want a different night. And I'm like, too bad. You got Tuesdays. That's you're out of luck. So, so every night, though, a different child is responsible for clearing off the table and putting the dishes in the dishwasher and starting the dishwasher. Okay? Why? To create responsibility. And then every other week, on the Friday night, it's... Kyle calls it Hunger Games night because we pass out pieces of paper and one of them says you win, which the kids know means you lose because that means you have to clean the table off and do the dishes. So we pass them out and they're all like, ah, oh, or ooh, right, right? And, and so that's how we do it. Why? Because I'm trying to teach them responsibility. People don't just cook food for you and things don't just appear and this is how it works. Are you teaching responsibility to those around you? Are you doing work at your office that somebody else should be doing? Are you doing something for your children or grandchildren or somebody else in your family that really they should be carrying? Because truthfully, if they can't carry it, yes, help them. But don't enable them. Teach them to be strong. So what are some of my boundaries? Here's some things you need to know. Feelings. Don't ignore your feelings. If you're resentful when you do something, Realize that that's a sign. Either you have to change your attitude or you should have said no. If you find yourself washing dishes and you're, I can't believe i got to wash dishes in this office. Well, one of two things. Either, either change your attitude and quit being grumpy about washing dishes. Or number two, don't wash the dishes. Now, if your job is a dishwasher, that might be a problem. You do, but you still have the right to say no. I tell people all the time, absolutely you can say no to your boss. You might be working less like none, but, but you can say no. And so realize that's your choice to do. And some of you are at a job where the boss has no boundaries. It may be time to say, not to quit, don't quit, but to start to get training or to go out of your way to learn a new skill so that you can now be motivated to find a different boss. Number two, your attitudes and beliefs, your behaviors. Remember, you reap what you sow, your talents. And number five, your thoughts and then love. You have to give and receive love. All right, so what did Jesus say about boundaries? Let's look at Matthew 18 very quickly. Here we go. Number one, be intentional about boundaries. If your fellow believer sins against you, go and tell him in private what he did wrong. If he listens to you, you've helped that person be your brother or sister again. So many of you have heard this passage talked about, about church discipline, blah, blah, blah. But Jesus is also giving some clear principles here. How many of you saw the CNN, I think it was CNN or MSNBC reporter this week, totally lose his mind and start screaming at anybody? Screaming at everybody. Tracy, you had to see that. I was going to say, okay. So he started screaming at his crew. If you didn't see it, what happened is he had his earpiece in and he was hearing hammering and people talk. And he lost his mind and somebody released it to the press. By the way, I actually heard that Casey Kasem actually did that years ago. I actually heard part of it. It's actually kind of funny. They had to beep a lot. But it's really kind of funny because Casey Kasem has got this really cool, and hey, today, and I can't believe they gave me this, really, and his voice is still kind of, hey. Uh, so anyway, but, but here's the deal. Jesus doesn't say, when your brother sins against you, scream at him. When your brother Steve screams against you, put it on Facebook. That's very true. It, you know, when your brother sins against you, tell everyone. No, no, no. What are you supposed to do? Go to him in private, which means that you have to plan it. It means you have to plan a time that it'll be private. It means you have to plan a time that you're not going to scream at him or freak out. You've got to be intentional. Too many of us wait until we're ready to explode and we explode instead of dealing with things as they happen and having good boundaries. So be intentional with this. Number two, it's okay to ask others to help you. But if he refuses to listen, go to him again. Listen to this. Take two other people with you. Every case may be proved by two or three witnesses. Now I realize this. Jesus said, okay, you tried to resolve something with somebody, and it didn't really happen, okay? And they said, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. Go to your friends. And here's what I realized. Probably most of the time, let's be honest, most of the time when you go to one of your friends, you say, hey, listen, would you go to me? And, and, and you know, I got to talk to Brian. Or would you go to me to talk to Brian about this issue? A lot of times your friends are going to look at you, and here's what they're going to say. Dude, that's not even a big deal. 
um, that's your problem. Truth is, when you go to your friends, part of it could be that your friends look at you and say, you know, that's not really Brian's issue, Eric. Yeah, you, that's actually your deal. And so sometimes you need some friends when you've gone in private first. Now listen, it doesn't say go to your friends first. It doesn't say go to, I have a prayer request to this group of 30 people. I want you to pray for Pastor Eric. I'm just concerned that he's a jerk. The other day he yelled at me in public, you know, or they even do it during a prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, forgive Pastor Eric as he yelled at me the other day. You know, they make it into something spiritual. Go to them in private and then go to a friend. Why? Because your friend may tell you you're crazy. And then number three, what happens? When you're struggling with a believer, then you ask leaders to help. It says if he refuses to listen to them, tell the church. What does this mean? It doesn't mean to get up in the middle of the church and go, I just want everybody to know what happened, right? No, no. It means you go to somebody in the church who maybe has advice, maybe has wisdom, maybe has a view that you don't have. They're not as close to it as you or your friends, and they can give you input. This is why counseling is so important. Did you know you don't always see everything the right way? I mean, I do, but you don't. You don't, right? Right? So we all feel like our perspective is perfect, but sometimes we need to back away and get some perspective from other people. The idea of telling the church was not to embarrass somebody and not to shun somebody, but to get help to restore that person, to go out of our way. So it was always about love, always about love. Most church discipline, and most times when people do this, it's about control. It's not about love. And most people who love to put this in their, in their bylaws, this is how we're going to handle things as a church. If you listen to their tone, you can instantly tell it's about control, not about love. Jesus was saying, if you love your brother, you're going to go to him in private. If you love your brother, then you're going to take somebody and say, hey, how can we work on this? If you love your brother, then you're going to get some help from somebody outside and say, hey, can you, can you kind of give me some input and help me know how to deal with this? And then finally, if you refuse to listen to the church, then treat him like a person who doesn't believe in God or like a tax collector. Ready? How did Jesus treat tax collectors? Yeah, one was a disciple, just so you know. It's the idea that you separate yourself from their influence. It doesn't mean you don't love them. It doesn't mean you don't care about them. Now, let me say something for the record, and some of you may get mad at me. And if you get mad at me, it's okay. If you disagree with me, come and see me. But I have had more than one counselor, actually several counselors have come to me. And they said, Pastor Eric, I've got to ask you a question. And I go, what? And they said, in the Bible, does it tell a woman if her husband is abusing her, if he's punching her, if he's hitting her, does it tell her that she cannot separate from him? And I said, uh, no. If he is hitting her, but she needs to find safety. Even Jesus walked away from the crowd that was trying to grab him. I said, so she needs to find safety. So you need to know this. I believe if someone's being abused, or you're being abused, you should separate from that person. Why? To not allow them to hurt you. If you go to a church and the pastor says anything different than that, leave the church. I can tell you right now because that pastor is about control and not about truth. And you can tell that pastor to come see me too. I'll take him on. All right. I'm pretty adamant about that one, aren't I? All right. So we started reading this book in our small group, and, and um, some of our folks read it. I did it with my staff. It helped all of our relationships. I had situations where I was dealing with where I used to get frustrated, and I started saying, why am I frustrated? I need to set good. Have I really? And by the way, a lot of times our frustration is because we've not told somebody else what our boundaries are. We expect them to know. Well, I didn't really want to do that. Oh, well, why didn't you tell me? And so this idea of boundaries helps us to relax. The, one of the first things I implemented, two things happened as I read boundaries. One of the things was... As I read Boundary, I started thinking, you know, my boys need to take more responsibility. And at the same time, a brand new study came out in the newspaper, and it said, boys tend to leave home later than girls. And I thought, I've got to read that. And I read the whole thing. You know why? Because it said, girls are given more responsibility in the house than boys. So I fired our lawn man, and the boys started mowing that day. <laughs> Absolutely true story. 
Do my boys mow our grass? Do they take care of our grass? Do they do it perfectly? Absolutely not. Uh, but, but they do a great job. And, and Dad follows up sometimes to, to do little things. But they do a great job on the yard. And here's the truth. They're learning other things too. They're learning how to fill a gas can. They're learning how to answer a phone. They're learning how, you know, they're learning how a lawnmower works. They're learning what good work does. They're learning how nice a yard looks after mows. They're learning what grass smells like. They're discovering where wasps are in our yard. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of things. It's not just the boundary. I'm also teaching them responsibility. So, are you afraid to say no? Or are you afraid to say yes? If there's a boundary in your life, look at it and begin to say, I'm struggling. If there's frustration in your life, say, I'm struggling and it's me. And take responsibility for you. If you're here today, the Bible talks about that God is a God of boundaries. In Revelation, there's a verse that says, I stand at the door and knock. This is God talking to us, saying he stands at the door of our heart and knocks. Can I tell you something about God? If you wanted to knock the door down, he can knock the door down. But he doesn't. The Bible says he stands at the door and knocks. And if anyone would open the door, it says he'll come in and dine with them. What a great image. If you're here today and you've never opened the door to Jesus, he will not knock it down. He will not force himself on you. He will not force you to become a Christian. But if you're here today and you want to give your life to Christ, and today you want to open the door, I want to encourage you to do that. And I'll be here after the service and you can say, Eric, I want to give my life to Jesus. Maybe you're here and you're a Christian, but the truth is you've shut everybody out because you were hurt. But it's time to forgive. It's time to establish boundaries. And it's time to say yes to the things you're supposed to and say no to the things you're not supposed to. We're going to start taking that steps, those steps the next few weeks as we journey together through boundaries. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Father, thank you for today. Lord, thank you that you've given us the right to say no to certain things in our lives. But, Father, you've also given us the privilege of saying yes and to do the things you want us to do. Lord, help us to have balance and help us to have boundaries. And, Father, I pray if there's anyone here who doesn't know you, that today would be the day they open the door to you. Father, as we have our time of giving now, and, Lord, as we give, we don't have to give. You don't force any of us to give. But, Father, you've given us the privilege of giving, knowing that everything we have is yours. So as we give part of that back to you, Lord, help us to be grateful and thankful. Not to give grudgingly, not to give in anger, not to give because somebody needs it, but, Father, to give because you've called us to give. You knocked at that door and we open it and we gratefully say, God, thank you for what you've given and we give it back to you. Lord, bless this time now. Bless this church. Continue to do amazing things. Lord, I thank you for the things that are going on behind the scenes. I pray you would continue to do what only you can do here. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have our closing song and our offering right now. You give what God's put on your heart today. And, uh...